Clements is the co-founder of Free Speech for People, a national nonpartisan campaign to challenge the creation of constitutional rights for corporations, overturn Citizens United versus FEC, and strengthen American democracy and Republican self-government. That's it? <laughs> okay. <laughs> Well, we'll, uh, we'll start with that anyway, see where it goes afterwards. He's also the author of a book, Corporations Are Not People, which is for sale out in this lobby, and he's happy to sign copies of it as well. Uh, Jeff served as Assistant Attorney General and Chief of Public Protection and Advocacy Bureau in the Massachusetts Attorney General's Office from 2007 to 2009. Um, and he also served as Assistant Attorney General from 1996 to 2000, where he worked on litigation against the tobacco industry and handled a range of other investigations and litigation to enforce consumer protection and antitrust laws. How quaint. <laughs> um, so, please join me in welcoming Jeff Clements to the stage. Uh, thank you. Thank you all. Thanks for being here. Thanks to Endicott College and North Shore Move to Amend and Professor Kilburn. I realized he was, uh, when he said that's it, he was um, making a little fun of my grand ambition, I think, of uh, um, not only overturning Citizens United, but strengthening Republican democracy in America. Um, and uh, it would be, it would be uh, sort of neurotically ambitious, uh, except um, obviously I don't intend to do that alone. I just uh, intend to join with my neighbors, friends, fellow citizens, such as you. And that's exactly what's happening around the country. So it's, uh, it's a pretty exciting time um, in our in our country, um, uh, as the old Chinese curse says, I guess may you live in interesting times. I think that's what we have now, but that's where there are big opportunities um, to really leave a legacy uh, for for our country, um, and that's what I'd like to talk about tonight. The Citizens United case. Uh, in many ways, is so bad for reasons I'll explain um, that it's good that it uh, it really um, said something out loud, very clearly to the American people, uh, a proposition really about who we are as a country, who we are as people, um, and and whether we want to accept it. Uh, it was a five to four decision. Uh, most of you know, I'm sure by now, uh, what the holding in the case is, as we lawyers. Um, it, it struck down the Citizens United versus the Federal Election Commission struck down the McCain-Feingold law. Uh, it, the particular piece of the McCain-Feingold law that had restricted corporate spending, that is spending by corporations in our elections for or against particular candidates. Um, now, what, what's a, one of the many things that is amazing about Citizens United um, and as Justice Stevens, who wrote the dissent in the case, said, it's, it's a radical departure uh, from American jurisprudence, from the First Amendment. Um, but one of the amazing things is, is that only six years before, in 2003, the Supreme Court had examined that very same provision and said it was perfectly constitutional. So what had changed in six years? Was there a constitutional amendment that nobody told us about? That you know, what had been constitutional in 2003 became unconstitutional in 2009? Well, you know, the only thing that changed uh, is Justice, Chief Justice Rehnquist died and, and uh, Justice Sandra Day O'Connor, who had written that 2003 decision, it's called McConnell, um, had retired to be replaced by Chief Justice Roberts and Samuel, Justice Samuel Alito. Um, so, you know, that's not how we're supposed to make law. It's not, it's not like, um, you know, the justices have a vote and struggled and, you know, get a new, a new justice and then you've got a majority and you're, you overturn everything that came before. It's not supposed to work that way. Um, but it's, the decision is not really just about, you know, lawyers or the justices fighting back and forth or, you know, what, what one case held or another. Um, what's so significant about Citizens United is it not only overturned that case from 2003, uh, it reached back, the court reached back to say, and, and by the way, a case in 1990 called Michigan versus Austin um, 
uh, Michigan Chamber of Commerce versus Austin, uh, where Justice Rehnquist had joined with Thurgood Marshall. And, and for those of you who follow the court, it's, a, it's sort of in the odd bedfellows department. Um, you know, Justice Rehnquist, known as a I'm pointing to the right because <laughs> he's conservative and Justice Thurgood Marshall over here on the left. They joined together uh, in, in a majority to say, of course Michigan has the power and maybe the duty to restrict corporate spending in state elections. And they carefully explained that corporations are not the same as people. They're creations of the state, that you cannot form a corporation in nature, it doesn't exist. You can form a business, you can you know, form a group of any kind, we can all associate. But if we wanna do a corporation, we have to have a corporate law that allows us to. We go down to the Secretary of State's office, we pay a fee, we get, we get a, a bunch of privileges. And that's really what a corporation is, it's a privilege. We get limited liability, we get perpetual life, not we, of course, the corporation. Um, and we get advantages that we, the people, think are, it's a good idea. That's why we have those laws in the economic sphere. And, but, and the danger, though, is that those powers, privileges, benefits that we create under our state law, over time, when you have massive global corporations, can be leveraged into political power, and so the economic power gets leveraged into political power, and that's something that Americans have always been wary about, all the way back to the founding. And that's where Citizens United really went astray, because by overturning these two cases, um, and really pretending, then asking us, forcing us really, if we don't change it, to pretend that corporations are just like people. They turn around the entire American project, really, the American experiment. This, you know, frankly, pretty radical, unlikely experiment when we started off, uh, you know, 240 years ago or so. My math might not be, might be off there, but some time ago, more than four score and all that, um, where we started off on this amazing journey to say, you know what? All people are created equal and we can govern ourselves in a republic. Uh, you know, no kings, no organized power. We can be free, equal people. And of course, we weren't then. We are, we, it's always, it's a dream we work towards, but that's what the American journey is all about. Um, and we, for that reason, we've always been, and our Constitution reflects, um, suspicious of organized, government-favored power. And, and that's what Citizens United turned upside down by saying corporations are just like people, you know, uh, that, that, that they have, um, that we, the people, are then not allowed to regulate them, not allowed to restrict the spending in our elections. And, and what that does, we're starting to see. Um, we're starting to see it with the super PACs. Uh, we're starting to see it in a lot of different ways um, where just massive amounts of money that no I individual people or even group of people could possibly compete with. Uh, and these are big global corporations we're talking about, not the many, many small businesses across the country that use the corporate form. Uh, it's, it's about global corporations getting a hold of our elections and our government. And so, um, you know, I, I did a brief in the case and we formed free speech for people uh, in preparation because we, we had some good idea that the court was gonna go down this road. Uh, and, and so I wanna talk tonight about um, not only that, but, but uh, why, why, where this came from because it has landed, Citizens United, has landed as a shock to the American political community, all of us. Um, it is a case that has said so clearly corporations have the same rights as you do and, and we are not allowed to restrict their spending in elections. Um, and they did it by saying things like corporations are, they never defined a corporation by the way. You'd think it's a, it's a case about whether Congress has the power to make a law for corporations that's different for human beings. You would think the starting point would be, well, what's a corporation? Why would Congress make that distinction? You don't get it. You can read the decision over and over again, and what you get instead are metaphors that we, that, that we can't have laws that depend on the identity of the speaker, or um, you know, Congress isn't permitted to silence some voices as if that's what was happening. And my favorite, that we can't make laws that have um, some, uh, that affect a disadvantaged class of persons Person. And that's literally, that's what they, they called it. So, so um, you know, that, that is, 
uh, is something that the American people have not bought, frankly. Uh, it, it, it's a proposition um, that we're being asked to accept. We're being asked to accept something that um, we haven't allowed almost all the way back to the founding to have corporations be able to spend money in elections. Um, you know, that McCain-Feingold law had its roots in a 1907 law uh, that Teddy Roosevelt pushed through to restrict corporate spending in elections. Um, and it goes all the way back to James Madison who said corporations may be a necessary evil but they must have guards and limits. And, and Thomas Jefferson who said that uh, he wished to crush in its birth the moneyed aristocracy of corporations. Um, so this is a concern that goes all the way back to the, to the founding and Americans get that. And so you see now with Citizens United uh, there, we've done polling at Free Speech for People with Peter Hart, who does polling for Wall Street Journal, NBC News. He doesn't just tell you what you want to hear. He's trying to figure out what are the American people thinking. And uh, the, the numbers are, are, are staggering. 79% of uh, the American people oppose Citizens United and support a constitutional amendment to reverse it. And that includes Republicans. It includes independents. Um, and Democrats. And so we have 79% uh, of the American people of that view. And you can see that if any of you have been fortunate enough as I have, and I'm sure some of you have because there are so many of these, to be in a town meeting this time around or the last year at this time of year, uh, and you had a vote on Citizens United and whether we should have a constitutional amendment to reverse it, you could look out at your neighbors, who some of whom you might not have agreed with on anything in, in years, and, and the vote comes up, uh, should we reject Citizens United as uh, antithetical to the American project of, of, of self-government and call on Congress to send an amendment, a constitutional amendment to the states to reverse it? Everyone practically, literally, like 90% perhaps, the hands go up, yes. We did that in my town of Concord uh, about a week ago. Um, there are now probably close to 30 Massachusetts towns um, where we've seen that kind of uh, vote across the political spectrum. 68 towns in Vermont did it in one night. And when they had their round of town meetings two or th uh, about a month ago. And again, we see Republicans, Democrats, independents, we have a lot of big problems in this country. We don't agree on everything, to say the least. On this one, there's widespread agreement. Um, and so the question is, how did it happen? Where did it come from? Because if we're going to, if we're, if you're in agreement that it, we, it can't stand and and have a, the, a, demo, a democracy uh, worthy of its name, um, I think we need to understand where it came from. That's what my book's about, and it, and it's also about how we can win to change to change it. And so. I look at in um, trying to figure out where it came from. I was at the Attorney General's office, as, as, as Michael said, and you know, repeatedly over the years have seen um, good, sensible public policy, or even public policy people could disagree with, but it was public policy enacted by the people, get struck down by the courts, get attacked by corporations as violations of something called corporate speech, um, and have tried to understand where did, where did this come from? Corporations aren't, aren't speakers, human beings are. Corporations Corporations are privileged from the state. Why, why shouldn't they abide by the laws? And, uh, and, and I came to understand this concept of corporate speech that led to Citizens United is radical and new. It did not exist until 1970s, late 1970s. And that's where my book begins. Back in Earth Day, April 1970. Um, seems like yesterday to many of us, and, um, but it was, it was some time ago. But it, it's, you know, it wasn't that far, uh, it wasn't that long ago. And it is hard to remember now when we see our stagnated political system that can't seem to move forward on anything, um, how responsive it was so recently. Uh, so April 1970, rivers are catching on fire, literally, because of toxics and pollution. The air is so foul that the children and elderly are dying, in this, and, and the, there's um, toxics going into the, the land. Uh, there's just a massive environmental problem because we'd had decades of industrialization without any any balance 
It was completely unbalanced. The corporations could just externalize, as the economists say, the toxics, the burdens, the costs onto the public and take the profits. And 20 million Americans came into the streets and you look at those pictures and it's, you know, cross sections of America, you know, suits, kids, families, all sorts of different people um, to say we need a different kind of deal. We need some more balance. We need to address our environmental problems and have a healthy economy too. And the response of our political system is nothing short of astonishing. Uh, within a few months, and a few short years, with Richard Nixon in the White House, again, this was a bipartisan response, we got the EPA, Environmental Protection Agency, created, it didn't exist before that. We got the Clean Water Act, the Clean Air Act, the Toxic Substances Act, the Endangered Species Act, the Safe Drinking Water Act, the Eastern Mountain Wilderness Act. I'd run out of fingers, I could keep going on, but they, just a, a complete reworking of the framework, and it was good. It was good for America, it was good for the economy, it was good for health, it was good for the environment. And, and it was an illustration that when the people wanted something, we could get it. And I'm not sure that would work today. And part of the reason is that what we are facing in Citizens United is a reaction. It is the end game of a corporate, organized corporate reaction to democracy working. And uh, there, there's one fellow who I talk about in my book, who you may have heard of, named Lewis Powell, who looked at this display of democracy, looked at um, the people in the streets and Congress responding and, and, and what he viewed as, as regulations of corporations that shouldn't happen. He was on the board of Philip Morris Corporation. He was on the board of about a dozen other corporations. He was a, a Richmond, Virginia lawyer um, and an advisor to the U.S. Chamber of Commerce. And he wrote a memo in 19, end of 1970 um, diagnosing what he saw and titled his memo, Attack on the Free Enterprise System. And it was a memo to the Chamber of Commerce and it outlined what he viewed as a, a problem of corporations not being aggressive enough to wield power and that um, he, he described what corporations needed to do to take power. And the memo is astonishing. It's, I quote it at some length in the book. You can find it on the, on the internet as well. Um, it wasn't disclosed at the time, uh, but the Chamber of Commerce called it the Powell Memo, and, and you can see it. And he talked about um, affecting and changing the social, legal, and political structure of America to benefit corporations. And uh, he even went so far as to say the best way to achieve that social, political, legal change would be to use his words, activist-minded Supreme Court to accomplish that. And he went on, and I'll just quote a paragraph from the memo. But independent and uncoordinated activity by individual corporations, as important as this is, will not be sufficient. Strength lies in organization, in careful long-range planning and implementation, in consistency of action over an indefinite period of years, in the scale of financing available only through joint effort, and in the political power available only through united action and national organizations. This was a call to arms, if you will, if money can be arms, of corporations to organize together effectively for as many years as it took to take power away from the people uh, to wield for corporations. Now, you could say, well, it was, you know, lots of people were writing all kinds of things, and, and big deal. Lewis Powell wrote out his views. Uh, well, six months after sending this memo to the Chamber of Commerce, uh, President Richard Nixon appointed Lewis Powell to the Supreme Court, and he became Justice Lewis Powell. This memo was not disclosed to the Senate Judiciary Committee. It was not um, revealed to the public. Um, there was a rather radical proposal um, you know, you can say it's good or say it's bad, but it was a radical proposal by any standard to use activist-minded courts 
to achieve social legal change for, for corporations. And we never had a debate about that because we didn't know about it. Um, so Lewis Powell sailed through 98 to nothing uh, in his, uh, I'm sorry, one, there's one, one vote against him, 98 to one. And, and uh, the same day, William Rehnquist, uh, that, that well-known, and he was well-known then as a conservative, uh, was appointed to the Supreme Court, and he had a rough time. Um, and I say I mention him because uh, it's an interesting story. Lewis Powell went on to write four key decisions that created, for the first time in American history, a corporate right under the First Amendment to strike down laws that affected um, what they viewed as their business models. Um, they cr created the corporate speech doctrine, um, which, which led, in the end, ex directly to Citizens United. Um, that was created by Lewis Powell and, and, and the many organizations and funding that responded to his call. Um, that's where ALEC, you may have heard of, the American Legislative Exchange Council came from. It's where the Washington Legal Foundation, New England Legal Foundation, every country, every region in the country now has a legal foundation, quote unquote, which is used by corporations to attack our laws. The National Litigation Center of the Chamber of Commerce came out of that, and they all went to work, as Lewis Powell recommended, to attack our laws and, and argue that corporations are persons, corporations are people, corporate voices can't be silenced, quote unquote. All of the rhetoric that we saw in Citizens United was born in, in after, after Lewis Powell's memo and after Lewis Powell wrote those four key decisions. And I mentioned William Rehnquist because remember this bipartisan, nonpartisan response to Citizens United, he was dissenting in those cases. He was saying, no, that is not right. Corporations are economic creations of the state and that, that they, we do that for advantages in the economic sphere for, so we can get innovation and martial investment and so forth, but they can be dangerous in the political sphere. And, and he kept def, um, dissenting, unfortunately dissenting, and this idea of corporations as speakers who could strike down our laws succeeded. The first one was actually right here in Massachusetts. Um, I'm sure many of you um, remember and, and may know Frank Bellotti, the Attorney General. One of the cases that um, Lewis, the first case really, Lewis Powell wrote uh, for a five to four court was Bellotti versus First National Bank of Boston. And Bank Boston, uh, Gillette Corporation, and the Digital Equipment Corporation followed the game plan that the Powell memo had suggested. And, at, and uh, challenged a law we had that said corporations should not be spending money, corporate money, in citizen referenda that have nothing to do with the uh, corporations. And the referendum at issue at the time was whether we should have a progressive income tax in Massachusetts. Um, the, the, those three corporations said that they ha had to spend corporate money in those elections uh, because they had to defeat that. Um, why it had anything to do with corp those corporations, it's hard to know. It's clear why executives at those corporations might not <laughs> like a progressive income tax, but it certainly didn't affect the corporations, although they argued that it would be hard to recruit top executives if we had a progressive income tax in this state, and that they should be able to spend corporate money, even though the people had said, no, we don't want that in our elections. Well, that law that got struck down. Lewis Powell wrote the decision. It was the first time in American history that an election law restricting corporate spending had ever been struck down under an idea that corporations uh, have speech rights, like just like people. Um, the next one was environmental laws uh, they went after. Uh, and a case called Central Hudson and three more where utility corporations struck down laws, written case, Supreme Court cases written by Lewis Powell. And that's what led to Citizens United eventually. He, he retired in 1987, but the court kept going down this path and really created a whole new language, a whole new th way of thinking that, that, that the notion of people with rights. You know, our government is created by us, by we, the people. We are born into this world with rights because we're human. <laughs> That's the, the nature of our, of, our, of our rights in this country. They're not something that the government gives us. We create the government and have our, our freedoms and our rights uh, before that. And now you have flipped that on its head where you have corporations which are created by the government in effect seizing um, those, those rights. And 
I, I'd like to just um, quickly give a couple of examples about why this is so dangerous, not just a constitutional debate, but really a question of, of who we are, a question of a power struggle, as Lewis Powell saw it, that, that whether, um, you know, the stakes here are big. They're very big. They're about who makes the rules in this country. They're about whether the, we are a government of, for, and by the people. Uh, or not, and, and I think it's no less than that. And you can look at those cases I mentioned as, as examples, um, but you can look at other uh, other examples. And I and I talk about a few of them in my book. And one of them is a about a fellow named Dexter Randall, a, a Vermont dairy farmer, 65 years old. Um, he's up in the Northeast Kingdom, and and in the late 90s, um, he heard about Monsanto had created a genetically modified bovine growth hormone. Uh, it's a, a called RBST. It's a drug genetically modified. It's injected into the blood of cows, and it forces the cows to produce far more milk than they ever could naturally. Uh, the cows, as a result, uh, can tend towards infection, and they're pumped with antibiotics, and they're basically transformed into milk, you know, production. Uh, machines uh, rather than uh, natural cows. And um, there's all kinds of health questions, um, animal welfare questions, social questions, economic questions about this kind of farming production. That's, you can't even call it farming, milk production. And, and um, Dexter Randall, uh, started looking at this and where did it, you know, what is this? How does it work? How's it going to affect dairy farms in Vermont and across the country? And he found that almost every democracy in the world had banned this because of these uh, studies that had showed the health problems and the fact that people did not want to have this kind of production of, our, of dairy. Uh, and, and in almost every democracy, Canada, Australia, the entire European Union, this is illegal to use. Uh, he went down, he brought these studies to the Food and Drug Administration. He um, tried to show uh, the, the problems. Um, he said they would not listen, that Monsanto just dominated the FDA and it was sailed through. So we're, we're one of the only countries in the world that allow this. He did not give up. He organized his neighbors, he went back to Vermont, Vermont, they pushed a law through, not really pushed, they, you know, people did what citizens are supposed to do. They organized, they did petitions, they went to the state house, and they got a law in Vermont, finally passed over, amazingly enough, overcoming the lobbyists from Monsanto um, that said you have to put a label on the dairy products um, that come from cows that are injected with this genetically modified drug. Uh, and you just have to say this, the butter, milk, ice cream, whatever it is, that it comes from cows treated with RBST. Um, and uh, months, so, so it was, sounds like a, the democratic process working, right? That, you know, policy issue, maybe it should have been banned, but at least, you know, Dexter Randall thought, well, people will be able to decide for themselves. And I'm, I'm confident, he said, that they'll decide they want real milk from farmers like me, not this stuff, uh, once if they can only choose. Well, they, we, we didn't get that choice because Monsanto and their allies uh, sued. Um, the state of Vermont, to say that that violated, that law that required disclosure violated the First Amendment, the corporate speech rights. And, you know, it puzzled people at the time. Well, what do you mean? We, if you want to call it speech, fine. We want you to speak. Put it, on the, put it on the label so we can decide. They said, no, no, you don't understand. The government, you can't force us to speak if we don't want to. So we're, we don't have to tell you about that. Um, so, uh, you know, it, it was, it was, Again, a theory, a tr a theory that um, Justice Rehnquist had taken on that, you know, the notion of the government not forcing we people to speak makes sense, you know, that we can't be forced to advocate ideas we don't believe in. We can't be forced to be, you know, go out and give speeches that we don't believe in. Um, you know, that, that goes to our conscience, our, our souls, really. Um, a corporation is not the same. And imagine where we'd be if, if, if across the board we could not have ingredients laws, we couldn't have disclosure laws by corporations. It makes no sense at all. They won, though. That Vermont law got struck down. And uh, to boot, Dexter Randall and the people of Vermont got a kind of lecture from the court saying they should not be violating the, the rights of others. Uh, and so not only are we the only country 
that allows RBST to be used, and the only one of the only democracies, but we're now uh, not allowed to require that we have disclosure so we can make our own choices. And uh, the, you know what is what, the, and I could give lots of other examples, but this one resonates at least with me because it it shows the sort of hollowing out of our citizenship, our hollowing out of our democracy, um, where the people of Vermont who pushed for that and got slapped down by the court and all the rest of us are essentially transformed from citizens uh, into, at best, consumers um, and, and maybe spectators uh, that, that were just not allowed to know. Monsanto's argument was it would cause fear and uncertainty if the, they, we, they were forced to disclose about genetically modified drugs being used in, in, in the uh, dairy production. Now, if it causes fear and uncertainty, that's all the more reason we should be able to have public debate and decide for ourselves how we want to approach that policy problem, it seems to me. Um, and so, so that's the kind of thing you see. And the other example I'd give is in West Virginia, we are seeing the future of America, in my view, if we don't correct this problem. And that's with the coal industry, and particularly Massey Energy. Um, they do something in West Virginia, uh, that they call it mountaintop removal uh, for coal mining. Um, there are 500 mountains that have been destroyed. They're gone. They don't exist anymore, the Appalachian Mountains. 500 of them uh, blown up, take, removed, so they can get the coal out without actually hiring too many coal miners uh, would be for, to dig under. They just remove the mountaintop. And where do they put it? They dump it into the streams and the rivers. So 2,500 miles of streams, Appalachian headland streams, are now gone. They'll never be back. They don't exist anymore because of corporate power. And it's not me saying that. It's um, the independent report uh, appointed by the governor of West Virginia after 29 coal miners were killed in the Upper Big Branch explosion uh, about a year ago now. And it was at a Massey mine, and Massey had had 62,000 violations of mining safety laws. 62,000, and nothing had been done. And the 29 men died as a result. And this report said the reason was because government and the corporation, Massey Energy Corporation, were completely intertwined because of the use of spending and political elections, um, their corruption of the government officials down there. And basically, what the government, which should have been there to enforce the laws and was doing nothing uh, because it had been disabled by this corporate power. And so, um, you know, we are, 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 you know, Bobby Kennedy, by the way, calls Massey a criminal enterprise. And um, we at Free Speech for People um, with Appalachian voices. I learned to say Appalachian. Don't say Appalachia if you go down there. They, they say, if you say Appalachia, we'll throw an Appalachia. That's, <laughs> that's how I learned to remember it. So Appalachian Voices joined us at Free Speech for People, and we filed a, a, a letter and an investigation with um, Attorney General Bo Biden in Delaware. Massey, like a lot of corporations, the biggest in the world, is a Delaware corporation. And Delaware law like our law and um, the law of, I think, every state says corporation is a privilege. And if you abuse it, uh, you can lose your corporate charter. The attorney general has the authority to bring a corporate charter revocation action in court. Now, these laws are on the books, and they've been widely ignored. And we need to reinvigorate them because they not only are a remedy for the kind of abuse that Massey demonstrated, but they remind us that these corporations are privileges, that they exist by a, 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 a choice of the states where they're incorporated, which retain the power to revoke the charters, which, you know, the benefits include limited liability, perpetual life, all kinds of things, but if they're abused, the states have the power to revoke these corporate charters, and we need to revive that, um, if nothing else, to remind us that corporations are not people. I mean, think about it. If we can revoke their charters, uh, if they exist as a privilege, how can it be that we can't restrict their domination of our elections with spending of corporate money? It doesn't, it doesn't make sense. And so, We'll see where that goes. The Attorney General is still looking at that, um, but it's an, it's an interesting case to be sure. And so I, I, I want to um, 
I guess mention one other thing, and, and not to just leave you all depressed about how bad it is, because there's a lot of good now happening um, with, to overturn this idea and really revive our, our democracy. Um, one of the big things that's happening is out in Montana, after the Citizens United case came down, the Attorney General of Montana, Steve Bullock, testified in Congress, and he said, uh, you know, I don't know what those fellows on the Supreme Court in Washington were thinking, but in Montana, we know that corporations spending money in elections absolutely corrupts. And Justice Kennedy in Citizens United, by the way, he wrote the majority decision. He's just sort of decreed as a matter of decree <laughs> that uh, spend independent expenditures, so-called, by corporations does not have a corrupting effect or the appearance of corruption and will not cause the American people to lose faith in democracy. Just announced it as if that could make it true. And of course, we're seeing that Americans are losing faith in democracy and it does have a corrupting effect. But Steve Bullock said, no, we know in Montana it has that effect. We saw it. Uh, the Anaconda Coal Company, uh, I'm sorry, Copper Company, used to literally own and control Montana. And this Montana's law that restricted corporate spending in elections was passed by referendum by the people of Montana in 1912. And the, uh, that's the only way Montana had been able to effectively take back and preserve a democracy. Uh, and Steve Bullock testified about how the average winning state senator um, spent $17,000, the winning campaign, that it was a true citizen uh, legislature where you could raise some money among your neighbors and in your district and, and run a campaign and they run these independent, uh, so-called independent expenditure ads coming in and that Montana was going to keep that law, thank you very much, and he was going to defend it. Um, in effect, after Citizens United, it was a, it basically saying, so sue me, and they did. <laughs> he was promptly sued uh, by a group, a corporate front group. They always have good names, Citizen United. This one was called Western Tradition Partnership and they sued the state of Montana. Uh, we filed an, a brief out there in support of the Attorney General. We were joined, by the way, by Montana business corporations, two of them, um, which know that Citizens United and corporate spending in elections is not good for business or for the economy um, generally, um, by the American Sustainable Business Council and the American Independent Business Alliance. They joined us in saying that Citizens United was wrong, that the Montana law should stand, and uh, everybody said, oh, you're wasting your time. Citizens United has already decided that. Well, uh, the, you know, the Montana Supreme Court didn't think so, and, and uh, five to two, the Montana Supreme Court it said, yes, the Montana law is constitutional, perfectly fine. Um, Citizens United was a federal law. We have a different situation in Montana. Um, now there was a, a couple of dissenters. Um, the dissenters uh, said Citizens United decided this question. That's the law of the land. We have to follow it. Uh, but then Justice Nelson, um, who wrote one of the dissents, went on uh, in about 40 pages of uh, description about why he thought Citizens United was so wrong, <laughs> and even though he felt obliged to follow it. And um, I want to, uh, before turning to some th specific things that we all can do to win this effort, quote Justice Nelson. Um, he is a Republican. He's uh, retiring uh, at the end of this year from the Montana Supreme Court. Um, he would be uh, not regarded as a radical by any remote uh, possible um, view of, of what that means. And Justice Nelson said um, this about, about his, his reading of the situation. It is hard to tell where government ends and corporate America begins. The transition is seamless and overlapping. In my view, Citizens United has turned the First Amendment's open marketplace of ideas into an auction house for Friedmanian corporatists. This decidedly was not the view of the constitutional founders. And I am compelled to say something about corporate personhood, Justice Nelson wrote. While I recognize this doctrine is entrenched in the law, I find the entire concept offensive. Corporations are artificial creatures of law. As such, they should enjoy only those powers, not constitutional rights, but legislatively conferred powers that are concomitant with their legitimate function, that being limited liability investment vehicles for business. Corporations are not persons, human beings are persons, and it is an affront to the inviolable dignity of our species that courts have created a legal fiction 
which forces people, human beings, to share fundamental natural rights with soulless creations of government. And then uh, Justice Nelson closed his dissent by saying, lastly, corporations and human beings may share many of the same rights under the law. They are clearly not bound equally to the same code of good conduct, decency, and morality. And they are not held equally accountable for their sins. Indeed, it is truly ironic that the death penalty and hell are reserved only for natural persons. So that was Justice Nelson in Montana. Um, and the case is now going up to the Supreme Court. We filed a brief last week. And uh, Justice Ginsburg uh, on the court has indicated uh, with Justice Breyer that um, after two years of Citizens United, it's no longer tenable, if it ever was, to say that independent spending by corporations doesn't corrupt our democracy and that they should use this case to reconsider Citizens United. Um, now that would be a good thing if they did, uh, but remember Justice Ginsburg and Justice Breyer were both in the dissent already in Citizens United, so I don't think this problem is going away. And so that means um, we have been asked whether we think we can live with this, and, and I think my answer is no. The answer of millions of Americans, Americans is no. Um, three states now have passed resolutions through their state senates and state houses saying that the Citizens United is deeply wrong and Congress must send to the states an amendment to reverse it. Um, that's uh, that's uh, New Mexico, Hawaii, and Vermont. Massachusetts is very close to doing the same, so keep the pressure on. Um, we want this resolution uh, to pass the Massachusetts. We don't want to be this, a state that doesn't get this done. So many states are doing it. As I said, towns and cities across the country are doing it. Um, and the, the, the question is why. So let me just close with that. With the constitutional amendment, we've done it 27 times before. Okay, and, and um, the, we, we do this, I think, when um, we have a situation where the Supreme Court has essentially given a proposition that we can't reconcile with the vision we all carry in our hearts, no matter what kind of politics we have, of America as a place um, that is trying to fulfill that vision of a, of a republic of free and equal people. The first time, uh, perhaps this, this was really uh, clear, was in the Dred Scott case in 1856. And after Citizens United came down, I went down to Washington to uh, meet with uh, Donna Edwards, a congresswoman from Maryland, who, who was right after the case. She became the first congresswoman uh, woman to introduce, congressperson to introduce a, an amendment to overturn Citizens United. Um, and she, her, her immediate reaction was, this is just like Dred Scott. And I, I didn't quite get at the time what she meant, but I've, I've thought about it. And the Dred Scott case, you may know, was in 1856, where the Supreme Court took it upon themselves, in their view, to settle the question of, that was dividing North and South, and just decided that under um, our law, the African American, in the words of the court, this is a direct quote, has no rights that the white man is bound to respect. And that's still in our Supreme Court reporters. It was basically saying to the American people, that's, we've settled the question, live with it. And the American people said, no way. That's where the Republican Party of Abraham Lincoln was born. And sadly, it led to the Civil War because it wasn't able to be resolved. But it was a proposition to Americans that we could not live with. And we had the 13th, 14th, and 15th Amendment after the, Constitu after the Civil War to say, you know, we mean it. We are going to be a free and equal people in this country. And after that, the Supreme Court even though the 14th Amendment says all people are created equal, all persons have life, liberty, and, and, and uh, property protected, women said, and men said, yes, finally, women get the right to vote because all are equal. The Supreme Court said, no, 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 no. That was a case called Minor in, in the 1870s. And the Supreme Court said, women do not have the right to vote under our Constitution. Once again, giving us a proposition. Um, we could live with that, uh, or we could say, no, we can't live with that and be the country we promise we we're going to be. And it took four decades, but they got a constitutional amendment, winning the right to vote for women. That's the 19th Amendment. And 
So, so this is how American democracy works. This is our struggle for our time. You know, and the progressives, uh, which was at the time, you know, progressive now may mean something else to people, but um, the progressive era was Republicans and Democrats, um, Republicans like Theodore Roosevelt, Democrats like Woodrow Wilson. It was a broad spectrum of American people who knew that we, they had to fundamentally challenge the Gilded Age corporate power of the time, of the, of the turn of the last century. Uh, and the Supreme Court, had, like in Citizens United, had said, oh, corporations have the same rights as people in the famous Santa Clara case and the cases that followed it. And the progressives did not accept that, and Americans did not accept that. And there was a constant you know, pushback that took years. Uh, but the progressives did four constitutional amendments in the space of 10 years. Uh, you know, we forget that. And people will tell you, oh, it's so hard. You can't do it. We don't do that. Um, well, they did four in 10 years. One was kind of dumb, the Prohibition Amendment. Uh, at least I think it was dumb, but I guess others did too because they did another amendment to revoke that. Um, but the other three, think about it, are who are, what our country would be without those. Um, women got the right to vote. Um, senators got elected. Uh, we didn't used to elect senators. They were appointed in smoke-filled, money-filled rooms. And in fact, it came out of Montana in the same time period when corporations were literally handing out bags of cash on the state house floor to get their senator in Washington. And we got senators elected by the constitutional amendment. Progressive income tax, the federal income tax, didn't exist until then. It got struck down by the court, the same court almost as pro-corporate as ours today that struck down child labor laws, that struck down maximum hour laws. They struck down the income tax laws, said you can't do that. Constitutional amendment to say, yeah, we can do that actually. And so if you think this one's hard, imagine being the folks who had to go around the country and get 80% of the people to say, yes, we'll have an income tax in our constitution. And they did it. And so this is, this is how we do these things. And it, it wasn't always way back when, too. We, the most recent amendment was in 1992, saying that Congress can't raise their salaries in the same Congress uh, before going back to the people for an election. We did it to lower the voting age to 18 in 1970. So this is part of our, our, our being a citizen in America, I think. And the question is for all of us is, do we face the kind of fundamental challenge um, with Citizens United and this sort of long-term corporate power buildup that warrants the effort for a constitutional amendment. And I put to you that we do face that, that we face a very grim future in America and the world if we don't fix this problem. And we can fix it all together if we can get a functioning democracy again, but we can't get there without overturning Citizens United, saying corporations don't have the same rights as people, that we can decide to have free, fair elections where money doesn't dominate. And so that's what uh, is going on across the country. I hope you'll join us. There's lots of things with Move to Amend here tonight that you can join in. Um, and this is not going away. This is campaign is building every day. So I really look forward to working with you. And I'll be quiet now. We can have some questions and discussion and get to work. And hopefully, uh, and I know we will, win back our country. So we'll be a government of, for, and by the people again. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Clements. That was great. Uh, we have some time for a few questions. I can pass around the microphone. How is it that uh, tobacco companies have been forced to put the warnings on their packages if these milk companies weren't forced to put that? Yeah. So did everyone hear the question? How is it that, how is it that tobacco companies are forced to put on the um, um, label about the Surgeon General says cigarettes are harmful to your health. I'm glad you asked. Um, one of the most recent corporate speech cases is just a couple of months old where the FDA rules that would have required uh, new warnings were struck down. Um, they were graphic warnings uh, like they have in other countries and the tobacco companies sued and said it violated their speech rights. They won. It was struck down. So we have those old 1967 warnings and um, I'm also glad you asked because one of the other big cases that sort of came home to me and many of us here in, in Massachusetts was the um, cigarette 
litigation in the mid 90s. I was at the Attorney General's office then, worked on that case, and we discovered and knew, and we have the documents to prove it, and it's no longer an allegation, it's a fact, it's been proven, um, that the to cigarette corporations engaged in a decades long conspiracy to addict children, manipulate nicotine, target children, literally, to get them um, addicted to smoking. They're, they called them in their, in their internal documents replacement smokers to replace the ones that died. And so after Scott Harshbarger um, settled uh, with the other attorneys generals, the, the nationwide cigarette case, um, we had a law here that said, the, remember Joe Camel? Remember the Joe Camel ads and the other ways they used cartoons to get children uh, to, to try to get them started smoking because they knew if you can get somebody smoking before 18, they probably have a customer for life for uh, biological reasons. If you have some cigarettes after you're 20 or so, it's you're not as susceptible to addiction. But if you get them started before 18, you've got a good customer for until the, you kill them anyway. And so Joe Camel ads were a big part of that. And the 72% of six-year-olds knew who Joe Camel was in Massachusetts. And uh, so we had a law that said a thousand foot buffer zones around playgrounds and schoolyards so you would not get the, all those ads targeting the children um, in playgrounds and schoolyards. They sued and said that violated their speech rights, the cigarette corporations, uh, and they won. That case is called Riley, the next AG, Tom Riley, def by the time it was done, and Riley versus Lorillard Corporation, and the Supreme Court struck down that law. So uh, the tobacco companies have, in fact, have been in the lead of using this aggressive, um, I'd say, perversion of our Constitution to strike down our laws. Uh, well, you don't see it anymore. Um, that law was struck down, and the, you know the pressure has been kept on. The the, part, the, the sort, sort of um, next uh, next chapter of all of this was the Department of Justice under George Bush and Bill Clinton both litigated for years a civil RICO case, and they proved after an 80-day trial racketeering of the of the of the corporations, and as part of you know, a negotiated um, judgment, they decided to not do the Joe Camel ads. And so it has, it has gotten better, um, but as I said, they just successfully struck down the graphic warnings on cigarettes that FDA tried to update. So thank you. Can you remind us who constitutes or who comprises Citizens United? Uh, a, sure. Um, so the, the Citizens United sounds like a good thing, um, uh, it's a, but it's more complicated. Citizens United is a Virginia not-for-profit corporation, um, and so they uh, um, wanted in 2008 to run uh, a movie, a full-length attack ad is how Justice Kennedy described it in the Citizens United decision, against Hillary Clinton. So there's nothing wrong with that. Um, you know, conservative group wants to attack a powerful senator who's running for president. That, that sounds okay. But what they wanted to do was take for-profit corporate money to fund it. And so it was sort of a, they, what they wanted was the super PACs that we now see, where you have a front group with a nice name that gets the corporate money in to run the attack ad. So that's, that's who what Citizens United is. It's a not-for-profit group, but the issue is no longer, you know, can a not-for-profit advocate or attack politicians. It's not that at all. It's about they wanted to use the corporate funding, just as we're seeing in the super PACs, and the Supreme Court made very clear in Citizens United it doesn't matter whether it's a not-for-profit, whether it's Goldman Sachs, whether it's Exxon. Corporations can spend whatever they want in our elections. Hi, you know, you know, with free speech for people, uh, backing the Constitutional Amendment, repealing Citizens United. And your book is Corporations and Our People. You know, it goes back into the 1889 when the corporations were afforded equal protection. 1893, they started getting the Bill of Rights. It's been going on for a long time. Is it? Wouldn't a better constitutional amendment be corporations are not people, money is not speech? Because I wasn't happy with the way things were before Citizens United. Yeah, no, me neither. <laughs> so, um, and to be clear, our, we support constitutional amendments that go 
fix this once and for all. And most specifically, the People's Rights Amendment. It's been introduced by Congressman Jim McGovern. It actually has a Republican co-sponsor, Walter Jones, from North Carolina. And it makes very clear that corporations, that when we say person, people, uh, or, or uh, citizen in the Constitution, we mean human beings. And that includes the you know, Equal Protection Clause, includes those 1890 cases you're mentioning. Uh, and it says, once and for all, the Bill of Rights is, is, is it's a human document. It protects the rights of human beings. And then we also support a constitutional amendment um, that has been introduced by Representative Sutton and on the Senate side by uh, Senator Udall uh, that says um, that part of Buckley versus Vallejo and the idea that we can't control spending in elections is overturned. That money is not the same as speech. In elections, we are able to regulate the spending of money. So we, we support attacking both of those fundamental problems, unlimited spending by any entity, um, and then the corporate uh, person problem. OK? I guess the free speech is behind the just repealing Citizens United, though, right? No, as I said, Citizens United is the end game of the problem. For the People's Rights Amendment goes at all the problem. Um, the, what, and, and, and I say that because it's a really important question because um, Citizens United, as I, as I see it, is really the, the sort of symbol, the last straw of our, of our day on this issue. But we have seen almost every generation has to have this struggle. And as I said, all the way back to the founders of corporations by their nature will push and push and push to try to leverage our political system to advan their advantage. And so we have seen at one point they were uh, twisting the Due Process Clause, the 14th Amendment, to, to claim rights that uh, belong to the people to strike down our laws. I think we actually won a lot of that battle with the Progressive Era and the New Deal. Uh, and then, in my view, the Lewis Powell approach and the Citizens United is the new version of this. But our amendment, the People's Rights Amendment, solves it once and for all uh, so that we won't have to keep fighting this battle every generation. Uh, first of all, I applaud what you're doing, and th thank you very much for thank the you. work that you're doing. Um, <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Um, I, I often hear from people that don't agree with the point of view that um, trade unions, unions have been influencing politics for a long time, and that by having corporations now with this new ruling sort of levels the playing field. How would you respond to that? Uh, sure, it's a great, so everyone he can hear the question. So y you do get this question, um, what about unions? I, I have a section in my book, what about unions? Because people do ask that, and it's a legitimate question, as I say in my book, that any concentrations, aggregation, of wealth and power uh, we are rightful, uh, rightfully concerned about and suspicious of. I, but I, you know, I describe, uh, you know, unions are now about 7% of the, of the workforce um, in the private sector, more in the public sector. Uh, and when you look at the uh, lobbying expenditures, unions aren't even on the map. I mean, the, the, but, but all that being said, um, <coughs> The law that was struck down in Citizens United applied to unions. So b people don't realize when they ask that question as if unions had some advantage. You know, the law that we, the people, had decided, the McCain-Feingold law, applied to corporations and unions. And now the Supreme Court says we're not allowed to do it with either unions or corporations. And so unions are actually just starting to try to do the super PAC game. Um, but you know they don't have the near the wealth that corporations have. But if you, I think the answer to that is, well, if you're concerned about unions, you should be concerned about citizens united because the Supreme Court has told you there's nothing you can do about unions. And so if we get the constitutional amendment, this, you, this, the People's Rights Amendment does not carve out unions or protect them. And, and the spending, you know, the, the Udall bill that would allow us to regulate money doesn't. So we would have a good debate. And, um, you know, I think if it was like it was from 1947 until Citizens United, unions will be regulated just as corporations are. Um, I recently recently heard um, Russ Feingold and the Steve, whatever his name is, from Montana. Um, oh, Bullock, yes, yeah, Attorney Steve General Bullock. Bullock, yeah. Um, and on the program, 
from Steve from Russ Feingold's organization, they were asking people, uh, people to call their attorneys general to have them um, sign on or write an amicus brief for the Montana case. Do you know if Martha Coakley has done that? Um, yeah, so the question is, has Martha Coakley signed on to a, an amicus brief in support of Attorney General Bullock in Montana? She's done even more than that, uh, I'm proud to say, uh, because uh, she hey, wrote a letter to the Senate Judiciary Committee for the state here saying pass that resolution. She supports a constitutional amendment. And then she just did a letter to the Congress signed by 11 other attorneys generals that she went and recruited, including Steve Bullock, calling for the constitutional amendment. Now, the specific a question about the brief in support of Montana. We filed our brief last week. Montana won't file their brief till another two weeks or so. And I'm confident there will be a state attorney's general brief in support of Montana. But it's not out yet. It's not, being, it's not circulated among the AG's office. So, so they haven't made any decision any, in any of the offices whether to sign on to that brief. But it, it's been pretty clear that Attorney General Coakley supports um, this effort and about pushing back against Citizens United, as do many attorneys general across the country. And this includes attorneys general in you know, Mississippi, New, uh, New Mexico, West Virginia, um, Bo Biden in Delaware, you know, which has a lot of corporations organized there, has signed on on this letter. So there's a, there's a lot of support for it. And I think we'll see a brief that's probably uh, signed on by many attorneys generals. Uh, and so we should, I think Senator Feingold was probably uh, quite right to, we should keep the keep the pressure on as everywhere else to make sure the AGs are, are, are supporting Montana as well. Yes. Yes. Um, you didn't mention um, Wyoming, and and when I heard, first heard of all of this, I had was at a meeting with um, Senator uh, Jim um, Eldridge. And he mentioned that it was how Hawaii and Wyoming had had already signed on to it, and then Vermont came along, and then New Mexico just since just recently. So uh, does that does that agree with what you're you know? Uh, well, I hate to contradict Senator Eldridge, yeah. <laughs> who has introduced the uh, resolution in Massachusetts. So he's he's been great on this. Um, I I was not aware that Wyoming has has done this, but I'll double check. Um, I had it Let's as so. as Hawaii, New Mexico. Uh, Vermont, uh, maybe Wyoming did as well. I'll, 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 I'll check that. That'd be great. Thanks. Yes, sir. I had a question about um, the scenario you see in terms of moving this forward. Um, can you hear me okay? Yes, I can. Um, I'm just wondering about getting the question on the ballot. Uh, and are we talking about um, this November uh, presidential election? If so, uh, what are the steps to do that? I just feel like if, you get the, if we get the question out there, you get it in the newspaper and people start discussing it, um, we get, a, uh, get the thing moving um, a lot, lot better than where we are right now. Yeah, so um, I agree. It's a very important to get the question framed up so people can debate and decide um, where they stand on this. And that's why the town resolutions, the city resolutions are so important, the state resolutions, everywhere where we can get it up to be addressed is very important. Um, and I think take a look down here at getting um, the signature pages that Move to Amend has available here to get instructions on the ballot um, to the state legislators to support this effort uh, is a big part of that. On the um, ballot, uh, you know, the ballots, of course, are state by state. And in Montana, uh, even, even as this case moves forward, uh, we're working with Common Cause to get it on the ballot in November uh, to support a constitutional amendment and, and say that corporations are not people, money is not speech. And I think wherever there's an opportunity and the resources are there, uh, to get a ballot initiative, it's an excellent idea. I'm hopeful that we'll have a, uh, a Massachusetts on the map for supporting this constitutional amendment um, uh, soon. Uh, I, and so I'd say, you know, yes to the ballot initiative, but let's also keep uh, contacting our state reps and state senators to get this vote on the 
um, S772 is the resolution in Massachusetts, S772, supported by the Attorney General, supported by the Senate President. We've had a, we had a hearing in the Judiciary Committee with over 100 people come in to say they want this. Um, we've got a lot of support, but it's still in the Judiciary Committee, so we need to get it out for a vote on the floor. And then again, ballot initiatives, and you know, houses of worship, community centers. I quite agree, I think it's so important. Anywhere we can frame this up as a, and, and have a debate and a vote, it's very important to keep to keep uh, to keep this campaign moving forward. Uh, Thank you. I, would, I wonder if you could repeat the um, is it the Chinese proverb or the saying that you um, oh, mentioned? May, you, may we live in interesting times, or may you? In, I think they called it a curse. <laughs> may you live in interesting times. Because when I came here, I was feeling a little bit weary. We marched in the 60s, the 70s, the 80s for change, the 90s, 2000s, and I was feeling a little weary when I came tonight, but as soon as you started to talk, I felt, of course, we can't sit back and relax and do nothing and go to the beach or bake cookies or whatever. We have to be vigilant and we have to pick up the struggle. And I'm glad to see some of the younger people here tonight because um, I think over the years I've felt sometimes that um, it's just us doing it you know, decade after decade. And now we see a lot of young people. Uh, I've seen a lot of young people um, being politically active over the years, uh, the last couple of years. And it's just wonderful to see that. And just uh, your demeanor, how um, you speak to us and you made the issues very clear and the fact that Kathy Laqui has really spearheaded um, a lot of the work that we're doing on the North Shore gives me a lot of hope and I'd like to um, just give everybody a, a pat on the back for being here tonight and for uh, picking up that activism that we of the older generations have been um, carrying with us all these years so that the movement will continue on and that we will be successful and it's been as you said we go back to the 1800s the 1700s this is what it means to be an American and if we don't maintain our activism uh, well let me put it in a positive way if we maintain our activism then we will take back ownership of our country. So I thank you very much for what you thank do. You. Thank you. Thank you. Hey, how's it going? Where, I got the mic. Ah, there you are. How's it going, everybody? It's good to see all you here and you're interested. Uh, I'd like to follow on what these two uh, people said, uh, this gentleman right here was talking about getting it out to the people, getting it in the papers, getting it framed in the right way so the people can debate it, um, and also getting the younger generation involved, you know, in the political spectrum, you know, to really care and see where this country is headed. Um, I guess I wanted to get your take on, I might already know the answer, but I was, I was a little astonished to find, I think it was last year in January, and I know the decision was in 2010, in January, right? Right, right. I had no idea. And I consider myself to follow current events, politics, I'm interested. Um, but I'm afraid I think a lot of my peers might not have that same inclination. And I, and I would like to hear your take on where is the media, you know? I might know the answer because they are corporations, but where, what is their role going to be and when are they going to step up or when are we going to hold them accountable to give us a straight facts, you know, and not hide it from us? Yeah, uh, well, thank you. It's a really interesting question, and I've, if I had uh, the answer, I'd, um, I, 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 it would, I'd, I'd feel a lot better. <laughs> and I think a lot of us have questions about the media. You know, we don't, we don't. Um, it's complicated. I will say that it's complicated, both in even defining the media. You know, we don't have the three channels and the, you know, Walter Cronkite anymore. We have a, a whole diverse array of big corporate media, and then we have a whole bunch of new media opportunities. And that's what I would focus on for now: is that, you know, we we don't want 
have to sit back and wait for you know, the New York Times to do an editorial to say it's okay to, <laughs> to support a constitutional amendment. You know, we don't need, um, you know, I think sometimes part of the problem is people watch the, the, the cable and they sort of watch what they already know. So, you, you know, you're on the left, you're going to watch Ed Schultz and Rachel Maddow, and you're on the right, you're going to watch, you know, Fox News, and they're sort of just reaffirming the stuff they already know. And I think our challenge is to break across all those lines and not ask the media to do it for us, uh, but to find avenues to do it, whether it's, um, you know, they did amendments when they had the, the, literally the Pony Express and horses going from town to town. So we've got Twitter, we've got Facebook, we've got all kinds of ways of communicating with each other and bypassing the corporate media. And eventually they'll wake up and say, whoa, there's something going on here. Uh, but we got to make the something go on here. And, um, and I think... Uh, you know, there, there's been um, the Boston Globe had an op-ed with um, you know Jim McGovern and, and yours truly about the People's Rights Amendment. Then they had Jeff Jacoby uh, sort of attack it the other day. And then today, I understand there's a page of letters from citizens uh, saying defending the People's Rights Amendment. That's the kind of breakthrough where we just had a, a flurry of public debate in the in a. If anyone reads newspapers anymore, I hope they do. Um, um, and we just have to keep pushing like that. And, um, you know, again, it's like we have to be affirmative citizens, not consumers, and sort of not wait for the media. But, but tell your friends, you know, use the tools that we have, and, and we'll, we'll get the word out there. I mean, it's really actually, from one perspective, it's remarkable, um, you know, that not everybody knows about this already. But from another perspective, it's remarkable how fast this has spread and built uh, in, in just two years. So I'd say keep, keep pushing and keep, you know, find your way to tell the story. I think what we're seeing is people are bringing whatever they can do, you know. I had the things I wanted to put in the book and I'm a lawyer so I did my thing, but I'm so inspired by what people do across the country. They're bringing to this whatever they got, whatever skill they have, whatever access and talents and connections and, and people are sort of putting this where it belongs, at the top of their list of, of things that are worth doing. And so I, I'd ask you to do the same, join, get your friends involved and if you don't see the media responding, create it yourself. Find it. Find a way to create it. Okay. Um, we're going to take. Uh, we're going to take about two or three more questions, and then afterwards, uh, Jeff is going to be available out at the book table. I think if you want to yeah, talk to him right individually and maybe sign a book. So over here first. Um, it seems like uh, since Citizens United was passed, there's been a qualitative change in the election process in terms of the amount of money that gets spent. Um, the anim anonymity of the money that, that they talk about. Um, my question is, uh, um, corporations are spending that money, but individuals are spending money as well. I mean, you didn't used to hear about one person slapping down five million dollars when for a, a political candidate, you know, in, in the Republican primary. My question is, even if corporations um, are no longer considered people and cannot make political contributions or, or I mean, how is this going to stop that uh, influence of this gilded, you know, like the gilded age of the individuals who are profiting and, and, and now have the, the money and the power, maybe not through corporations but through their own, what happened that made it that also become reality of individuals being able to spend so much money in the process, and why are super PACs, particularly now, you know, such a huge phenomenon? Yeah. So, um, you know, as I said to the question here, I, I see both of those problems as fundamental to whether we're going to have a democracy that works. Um, we have to get at the corporate power person, you know, the corporate person problem, the corporate power problem. But we can't only do that. We also have to retain, recapture what we always have had until the court said we don't anymore, which is the right to have a free, fair election where you can't just, you know, if you have $30 million to drop into a campaign, you are not allowed to do that because that sh shuts off the debate of everybody else. Um, we don't have that now, and that's why we support constitutional amendments 
whether it's combined or in two separate ones, that say both of those problems. One, the, the People's Rights Amendment, which takes on the corporate power problem. The other, the Udall Amendment that says, um, you know, essentially overturns a Supreme Court case called Buckley that said you can spend whatever you want in elections. We used to have our law around the same time as Earth Day, in fact, before Powell and others got on the court, where we restricted spending by individuals. Uh, we had maximum amounts, not only for contributions, but independent expenditures and PACs, and the idea was, you know, you come to the ballot and the election time as equals, as equal citizens, and you can't do that if, if you're not allowed to have some kind of control over the domination of, you know, not even 1%, it's like point zero one percent of, of the people and the wealth in the country being used in that manner. So we do need to get at both problems in my view and with the amendments that we support do that. By the way at freespeechforpeople.org under the resources tab we have all the amendments. You can link to them and see them and so you can see how each of them get at these problems. Okay, thank you. Yes. Um, I actually just wanted to respond to the comment about youth not knowing about this. Watch more Stephen Colbert. <laughs> That's true. He's got his own super PAC, um, which I think is called Making a Better Tomorrow Tomorrow. And he's been going around um, actually having an attorney um, who's been fighting th um, this kind of decision representing him. Um, and. All of the satire is fantastic. It shows every abuse possible. He's transferred um, ownership of the pack to John Stewart, and they've uh, had conversations back and forth about how they're not affiliated. The name of the pack actually changed to "This Pack Is Not Affiliated with Stephen Colbert." <laughs> <laughs> that I think is the kind of thing that that demonstrates the point. And I just wanted to ask: Are we completely giving up on the FEC? ever having any teeth at all? Yeah. <clears throat> so to the first part of the question, I'd second that. The Stephen Colbert uh, has done a tremendous job at making very clear the corrupting effect of the Citizens United decision. Um, and it reminds me to say we, we have uh, done a partnership at Free Speech for People, the American Sustainable Business Council, and Ben and Jerry's uh, to support this campaign. And it's called getthedoughout.org. <laughs> and uh, this summer you will be seeing on an ice cream flavor that's Stephen Colbert's ice cream called Americone Dream, which is a, a Ben and Jerry's ice cream. And Stephen and Colbert's scowling on it, but this summer you'll see a link to the Free Speech for People and, and this amendment campaign. And, uh, and St they, Ben and Jerry's, and, and we did a press release about it, and Stephen Colbert was quoted in the release. And he plays, as you may know, this sort of you know, right-wing bully, but, but it's satire. But he says that he's deeply offended that his ice cream flavor is being used for what he's called treason. And <laughs> because corporations are people, he says. And so uh, he's, he's, it's very funny, effective satire to take on a very serious problem. And, 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 and I think, again, people bring whatever they have to it. He brought that, and it works. So I, that's a, uh, thank you for that. The FEC. The the Federal Election Commission, um, the question about whether we've totally given up on them. A lot of people have, uh, actually. Um, they don't do anything that is productive, and they do a lot that is destructive. Uh, and um, in fact, they, they were the ones who ruled after Citizens United that um, the uh, super PACs uh, essentially could be created because it would. They, their reading of Citizens United said that means that anyone can put any money they want that question about individual money pouring in um, into super PACs. And, um, you know, it's, it's, it's a somewhat dysfunctional agency, but two, uh, you know, the problem is um, it's a broader dysfunction. I mean, the Congress after Citizens United could not even pass disclose. Um, so something that everybody said they're in favor of, disclosure, got filibustered and blocked. And so the FEC is divided in the same way, Republican appointees, Democratic appointees, and they can't get out of their way. And I think, you know, 
that's why I think this amendment campaign is so important. We need a movement across the country. We're not going to be rescued by the FEC. We're not going to be rescued by Congress. We're not going to be rescued by big media. We've got to rescue ourselves, and uh, that's where we are. So, thank you. Thank you. First, a, a question or a comment to galvanize people and give them a sense of urgency. At the local ballot question level, I'm quite sure that to get a question on the ballot, the papers have to be completed 120 days before the election, which means July 6th. Whatever you're going to do, it has to be July 6th. I don't, and so we need to get moving. It there's not much time between now and July 6th to get your local your local ballot um, or your local question um, to a ballot for the November 6th election. And the second is, is there, among these papers circulating, is there a state ballot question, statewide ballot question being urged or is someone developing an effort to do that as well as the individuals, you know, the individual communities and as well as contacting our legislators? <laughs> Um, well, I'm not aware of a state ballot initiative. I think, you know, we've approached this, um, at least at Free Speech for People and our allies, and I think Move to Amend has done s similar approaches of sort of strategically looking at what works in which states and which communities and getting ballot initiatives where that works, but where the legislature can get, you know, we can get a lot of citizen activism and education and push a legislature to get a, a resolution. Um, we can use that method, and so again, I, I'm hopeful that in Massachusetts we'll have a, a, a resolution passed by the legislature and we'll be, we'll be moving forward with that. Um, I'm not aware, and maybe Kathy, is, um, whether, whether there is a um, state ballot initiative underway. And she's saying, shaking her head now. Um, but there is the, these, uh, these would be on the ballot in November, Kathy, is that right? So to sign up, and this would be in individual legislative districts to put a question on the ballot as a policy question, essentially, supporting the amendment idea. Um, we're only going to have time for one more public question, which has already been taken, but I, I do invite you to speak privately with Jeff at the book table outside. I just thank you so much. This is so enlightening. And I wonder, do you have a site or someplace? Do uh, you have any other speeches soon? Because people that were going to come tonight couldn't, and I don't know how often you do this. Um, yes, yeah, sure, sure. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, well, freespeechforpeople.org is a good site for all sorts of um, resources on this. Move to amend.org uh, for our move to amend folks is also good. Um, I have a blog uh, that I try to keep up to date that has links to some appearances and things like that. It's called corporationsarenotpeople.com, just like the book, corporationsarenotpeople.com. So thank you very much, everybody. I look forward to working with you. We'll win this.